Major funding for these broadcasts is made possible by grants from New York Community Bank, Capital One Bank, Perfect Building Maintenance, Chase Commercial Term Lending, M&T Bank, Genova Burns. Additional support is provided by AKA Hotels, Corman Communities, Aerial Property Advisors, AVR Realty Company, Bank of America, Merrill Lynch, Bank Layumi USA, Briarwood Organization, CBRE, Citizens Bank, Collins Building Services, Connect One Bank, CPEX Real Estate Services, Cushman and Wakefield, DDG, Dime Savings Bank of Williamsburg, Douglaston Development, Levine Builders, Fisher Brothers, First Nationwide Title Agency, Flushing Bank, Friedman, Handler Real Estate Organization, HAP Investments, Investors Bank, James D. Kuhn Real Estate Center at Syracuse University, Kilroy Architectural Windows, New York's Window Company, Madison Realty Capital, Matone Group, Mercantile Commerce Bank, Meridian Capital Group, New Banks, Optimum Window Manufacturing Corp., People's United Bank, Rosewood Realty Group, SJP Properties, Sterling National Bank, Stonehenge Partners, TD Bank, Terra CRG, The Continuum Company, The Moynian Group, and These Friends. Brooklyn, New York, Lafayette High School. 15-year-old kid graduates from Lafayette High School. What's he going to do? He, he knows nothing. He's not skilled. But he becomes a professor at Columbia, becomes the head of the department at Columbia, becomes a professor of art at Brooklyn College. But more important, he becomes probably the preeminent Jewish artist in the world, and a good friend, and more important, the author of his newest book called The 613, The 613 Commandments, my good friend Archie Rand. Let, let, let's get to the period of time that you and Maria and your daughter at Yeshiva Flappish, okay, the preeminent Yeshiva Flappish. What happens there? Uh, at the Yeshiva, and there was a, uh, a fellow there named David Schwartz, Dave Schwartz uh, decided that I should paint the interior of a synagogue of a friend of his. No, but you had originally done work with Dave on ah, these painted the exactly. murals, right? Yes. The, the, Dave, the murals. Dave had a had a kickoff dinner. That is, uh, the school was very active in fundraising, and there was an auditorium that uh, every year when they had the kickoff dinner, which was the dinner that preceded the big fundraising dinner at the Hyatt or the Hilton or something. Uh, they would have another dinner to get all the people in who would give money and then give money again. So he said to me, why don't you do some murals on the wall? So I looked at the wall. The wall was about 30 feet high and 50 feet long. And I figured, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll do these murals. You had done a number of art pieces during the period of time, and you, you, you showed at the Tiber Gallery going back. But was that the beginning of Judaic art for you? Um, or was it the Hadassah with your mother? <laughs> the Hadassah with my mother, wow. Um, I was, I was a kid. I was an adolescent, maybe 13, 14 years old. And my mother was the, funny you should bring that up. My mother was the editor of the, well, she was the president, I guess, of the Bensonhurst chapter of Hadassah. In fact, later on, when she moved to New Jersey, she lived next door to Julian Schnabel's mother, who was also the president of her Hadassah group. So she calls me up one day and said, do you know Julian Schnabel? This is like in the seventies. Anyway, Hadassah ladies, she's the president of Hadassah. And, uh, She's putting out this Hadassah newsletter, and she's typing it very diligently and pasting it up with, with uh, rubber cement. And the covers are little clips, little tiny bits of, like, smiling people. And I said, Mom, what are you, kidding? This is, this is a cover? That's, no one's interested in that cover. He said, well, what can you do? I said, what can I do? You want me to do the covers to your magazine? So I'm 14, 15, 16 years old, and I'm doing these these collage paste-ups. But they didn't have Judaic art in that. Well, they would be things like 
you know, the Purim issue. So I would do a Purim drawing or something. None of this seemed out of the ordinary because at the time I'm working on the high school art literary magazine. Uh, I had a, can I digress for a second? I had a wonderful teacher, uh, high school teacher, who was fired the year after I graduated from mental incompetence. But everyone that she taught became a great artist. She was magnificent. Um, and when we did the high school art literary magazine, we would be laying out pictures and text together. And I was the editor, and we went from nowhere in the national rankings under her leadership. Her name was Miriam Edelman. I'll give her a plug. We went under her leadership to having the Columbia National Gold Medal as the best high school magazine in the country. So the two years I was there with her, or we were there with her, it was a team of us, we did fantastic stuff. And then when she was fired, uh, the magazine went back to no rating at all. It just dropped out. But she, she had got me involved in, in doing this paste-up layout stuff. So the, so, it was Jewish content. Okay, so, so we're over here, you're, you're painting these murals. Now, what were on these murals that you did for the Yeshiva of Flappish? The first mural uh, was the Twelve Prophets, and I had to research that. I guess in answer to your question, yes, that was the first serious involvement. Although in 1972, I did a show of paintings, of abstract paintings, that I named after the ten rabbis of the Yom Kippur Martyrology, and uh, nobody noticed Nobody. In fact, there was a critic who had the same last name as one of the rabbis who never even realized he was named after one of those rabbis. It was weird. The first one was the Twelve Prophets, and I did have to research. I bought a lot of uh, books, English translations of rabbinical commentary, because I wanted to do it right, because I'm dealing with an you know, observant uh, congregation here. And then the next year, uh, I did something equally difficult. I researched uh, Jews in American history. So that was a kind of book report. But I was always a good student. I could research. So I'd come up with these, you know, factoids about Jews and then do illustrations to approximate some accomplishment. So he introduces you, after you did the murals, to this benefactor of the Syrian community who's building a synagogue called the Bnei? Bnei Yosef. Bnei Yosef, which people call the Painted Shul yes. later on. Okay, this is 1970... I was approached in 73. I started in 74. So 1974, you're 25 years of age. 24. 24, 25 yeah. years of age. And even though you went six years to Hebrew school and you would occasionally go with your mother or your brother to the temple on, 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 on the Sabbath, you really you, you had to gain experience and understanding because this was an Orthodox synagogue. Absolutely. And... You started these murals, these paintings. So some of them were the fish, some of it were the menorah, some of it were other pictures. But what happened? They, they, they said you were heresy? Well, because there was no precedent for this, which I didn't realize when I took the job. I mean, I should have known. I was familiar with Percival. Do, do you think Chagall had precedent when he did work of Jewish art? Chagall didn't work in a working synagogue. Chagall did, you know, these wonderful, you know, stained glass windows. He did this incredible ceiling of the Paris Opera House, which if the Paris Opera House is like the Met, then it's full of Jews anyway, you know, but uh, it wasn't a working, a working synagogue. And, uh, you know, this, this hadn't been done since the second century in Dura Europus in Syria. It was probably done a lot, but they'd been destroyed. But the last evidence we have of a painted synagogue that had thematic murals as opposed to dec decoration. So, so what happened? The congregation, the some congregation, members were upset about your Some work? members were understandably very, very upset. I was too young to be kind enough to think understandably because I was doing what I thought was the right thing. But uh, they, they thought that I was doing everything from blasphemy and heresy for painting the walls at all to actually trying to introduce symbols from other religions and some kind of subversive you know, conspiracy theory. But uh, there was a significant number of, of learned and respected people in the community who were very upset. And there was an equal number of people who uh, were supportive. And uh, what we found eventually is that there were two sets of rules, and we had to go to the highest Talmudic authority in the world at the time, who luckily lived in New York. Uh, but he was somebody who was respected by all the sects of the Jewish community. He was uh, respected by the Syrian community, by the Sephardic community at large, by the Ashkenazi community. Uh, he was the last word, and he said he could do it. So the Painted Shul, or the Painted Synagogue, is, is the first. Let's talk about some of the other programs, because many of them have the biblical or Jewish connotation. Right. Okay? right. 
what, what, what happened was, is, um, and as I mentioned before, when I started doing this commission, the other artists with whom I was very friendly were, were upset with me. Uh, they didn't like the fact that I was working figuratively, I was working religiously, and something inside me told me also that they were very upset that I was working Jewishly, because there are a lot of Jewish people in the, in the art but world. But you know, you bring up Jewishly, and, and in, the, in, in the beginning of the book, you talk about Jewishly of Mel Brooks in 1977 <laughs> with Blazing Saddles. 74, yes. Right. Yeah. So, I mean, it let's was, bring that up. That was remarkable. Uh, and when I was doing B'nai Yosef, uh, I was going against what I thought were some rabbinic proscriptions, but I knew that there were others that supported what I was doing, and I was banking on those. And just at that time, Mel Brooks comes out with Blazing Saddles. And the poster for Blazing Saddles has a profile of Mel Brooks with a uh, Native American war bonnet. And the beaded message on the war bonnet is written in Hebrew, kosher le Pesach, kosher for Passover, in Hebrew. And uh, I thought to myself, you know, there are people in the Midwest, tall, good-looking, blonde people with blue eyes carrying their laptops to work, and they think that this movie is hysterically funny. So something is breaking down here. The, the, the notion that, you know, that Lenny Bruce originally had of bringing Jewish culture to a wider audience is right in your face at this point. Mel Brooks is making a major Hollywood movie that's full of Yiddish. And uh, I thought, that's it. You know, we, can, we can introduce this, this facet of, 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 of minuscule visual culture that is, whatever, whatever Jewish art was at the time, into the larger aesthetic discourse. But yeah. we, when we got together the other day, we were also talking about the, the comic strip, many of the comic strip uh, artists right. were Jewish. Yeah. And, and, you know, they basically, in certain ways, used their comic strips as a means of showing some Judaism. Yes. In, uh, in, 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 in a degree. What, what happened with the Jewish comic strip artists, and this is my conjecture, but it's based on my historical analysis, is that if you went to art school and you were Jewish, and there were many Jews in the 20s, 30s, and 40s who were part of Jewish art groups, uh, out of which came people like Adolf Gottlieb and Mark Rothko and Chaim Gross, Raphael Sawyer, they were able to introduce themselves. But at the highest level of, as, of aesthetic visual dialogue, they weren't allowed entrance. So there were some artists who, realizing that they were never going to be accepted as first-rank artists, you know, Raphael Sawyer spent his whole life trying to be Degas, God bless him, but like, it wasn't going to work. They went into this underground industry, which was totally discredited, which was the making of comic books. And as such, it, it became, in retrospect, at least to me, a kind of Jewish language. Uh, and it was its... Cartoons are the only drawings that in Western culture are not translated into paintings. That is, if you see a sketch, you'll say, oh, that's Michelangelo's sketch for the Libyan Sybil. But if you walk into the Sistine Chapel, you say, oh, that's Isaiah. It's not Isaiah, it's a painting, you know, but you don't call it that. But cartoons, you say, you know, well, what did Blondie say to Dagwood? So cartoons are basically accepted as truth without being translated into painting. And Jews were pioneers in this, most notably Will Eisner, who sort of invented the modern comic book form. Would we say that, you know, the 54, mm -hmm. what's the 54 stand for? The 54, it was a series that I did of the 54 chapters into which the Torah, or the five books of Moses, is broken as Jews read the weekly chapter every Saturday in synagogue. And I decided that that was a good topic to invest my, my time with. I became more and more interested in the notion that Jewish art didn't exist on a larger aesthetic dialogue. That is, there were plenty of pictures of dancing Hasidim, there were, you know, Jewish stars, there were menorahs, but the idea of actually going into the scripture, going into the observance, the ritual, and pulling out subject matter. So the 54 was 1989, and it was an attempt to make a body of work that was undeniably coming from the stream of, of insular Jewish dialogue. It wasn't, it wasn't ecumenical. It wasn't, you know, love your neighbor, peace and kindness, charity. It was, who cares about this stuff other than Jews? You know, and I wanted to make that manifest because that was not happening within the community. And what other, besides the 54? I did a lot of work in the Haggadah. I did the Chad Gadya. I did the 39 Forbidden Labors of the Sabbath. 
um, which was a strange series. I did 60 paintings from the Bible, which was done all in cartoon style. My question is, is this cartoon style or is this art? Or is it both? Uh, to, me, to me, it's art. And uh, the reason that it's art is because what I'm trying to do is identify that drawing style, which is popular uh, among graphic novelists, uh, people like Jules Pfeiffer, Art Spiegelman, to elevate that uh, to the level of discussion that other, other minority or, or, or unaligned uh, art forms have been elevated. So, so how do you wake up one day and say, 613? Actually, I had a, I had a friend. Uh, he was a you had an epiphany? Or? I, I had, well, I, I wanted to do something so large that it, it couldn't be seen as ironic. But at the same time, I knew that I wasn't going to make the double negative of doing something serious and painting it seriously. So I had to cover both ends. And I had a friend. He was a philanthropist and a supporter of my work. He was a collector. And we were sitting around one day, and I mentioned this to him. I said, I want to do something enormous. And he said to me, uh, well, there's 613 commandments. And I said, uh, you're on. I think I'm going to do that. And he said, you're kidding. And I said, no, I'm really going to do it. He said, good. You know, and uh, that just seemed like something. Now, how large is each of the 613? Oh, they're about, I don't know. <laughs> how large is each of them? I think I'd measure them by now. Uh, probably about mm, two feet by 20 inches, maybe 24 by 20. And it's a total of 1,700 square feet? Yes. Uh, when I installed it in my warehouse, the walls of the warehouse at the time were 18 feet high and 100 feet long. And they went almost to the top of the ceiling, and they were about three inches shy of the front door. So the exact measurements at the time of that installation was 17 feet high and 100 feet long, one painting. And how many years did this take you? Well, on and off, it took five years. That is, I would, I would tackle a couple of these in between shows. That is, I did the Hot God Ya series, complete with sketches, you know, preliminary paintings and the larger paintings, while I was doing this, and a couple of other series. But in between series... And you were also at Columbia University. I was also, I was also at Columbia. So how did Columbia... I was at Columbia and at Brooklyn. I started this at Columbia and ended it at Brooklyn. So how did Columbia... And Brooklyn College take to your art um, well to the six thirteen i was I was uh, brought into Columbia on the basis of a whole other career trajectory, uh, and very few people knew I was doing this, um, so this was not public. However, some people on my faculty, some colleagues and some people in other departments were um, not dismissive but gave, they gave me friendly advice that I wasn't going to get anywhere doing this stuff. And I think they made the, they had the misunderstanding that I wanted to get somewhere. That is, they were thinking in terms of career. I remember my friend Grace Hardigan said to me, there's your life, your art, and your career, and they have nothing to do with each other. And I figured my, my career was doing okay, uh, and my art was doing okay in that career uh, sector. This particular aspect of my art was my business. And at some point, when it coagulated enough specific gravity, I'd be able to try to introduce it to the larger world, which is what happened with the publication of this book. It finally got out. When I showed the 613 in 2008, I showed it for one day. The New York Times was there with a clicker. And uh, they counted in four hours, a thousand people showed up. And I thought, that's pretty amazing. This stuff has legs. But uh, it hasn't entered the, the, the curatorial or the critical dialogue. But, you, I mean, you've shown around the world and Israel and other places... But you haven't been able to show in certain places like the Jewish Museum. Well, uh, I showed at the Jewish Museum. Uh, I showed, a number of years ago. Yeah, I showed the, the 54 chapter paintings there. But, you know, museums, no disrespect intended because all museums work this way. Museums are increasingly dominated by the desires of their board and their trustees. And these people are getting involved in collecting for the reason many Jewish people are involved in collecting, or many people in general, because it's an assimilative activity. So these people, the trustees, and I'm making a conjecture at this point, I assume that they're in the, in, that they favor promoting people whom they collect and whom they're interested. And those people will not be significantly Jewish in their subject matter, because that subject matter hasn't been 
a, hasn't been commended by the critical discourse. But look, looking at you, your artwork, I, I haven't seen the, the dance it cussed, as you would say. No. Your, your, your illustrations and your art doesn't have the dancing cossets. Sometimes you have the green... <laughs> the green the, the green hornet <laughs> or, or something like that. So when, when somebody says over here, and one of the commandments is, the Nazareth must not eat great raisins or drink anything steeped in grapes. Right. And you put a picture of a mouse on a blue chair. Mm -hmm. And what else? Well... The, the pictures are not themselves illustrations, because what happens, I mean, you've, you've brought up a very dicey question, and although I know you're going to want to cut me off on this, I'm going to have to say it. Jewish art, which is a strange term to begin with, but art that deals with Jewish subject matter hasn't existed for a long time for two reasons. And the first is, is that if you, I, a painting unlike music, poetry, film, literate, you know, any other, any other art form, a painting unlike any other art form, transmits its values 24 hours a day. That is, if your boss is, for instance, an anti-Semite, and his car breaks down in front of your house at 3 o'clock in the morning and it's raining, and he knocks on your door, and he says, I have to make a phone call, and he walks in, and he sees an obviously Jewish, he sees a Mark Chagall rabbi with tefillin on his head, and he says, you're Jewish. You can't shut it off. You can go to an Itzchak Perlman concert and you can hear him play Kol Nidre. You can go to the Carnegie Deli and have a corned beef sandwich. You can go home and read a Dean Steinsoul, so Philip Roth. And then at three in the morning, if you're hungry, you can have a ham sandwich. So all of those things are time-based. Paintings are not time-based. So I figured I've got 2,000 years to catch up on. If it wasn't for the Christians, there would be no Western dialogue in art because they, they were basically holding this, holding this up. But, but, so I had to invent an iconography. And it was more important that I did... I'll let you go in a second. It's more important that I not allow the text to dominate the visual, which is what I was doing for 20 years, from, from B'nai Yosef through the Mechlala murals, right up until the 54 chapter paintings. I was trying to make a picture that would accommodate with rabbinic approval. Uh, after that, I realized as long as you're doing this, your pictures are always going to be illustrations and they're not going to be art. They have to be primarily visual. So when you have a mouse sitting there, the, quest, the, the question is, if it's not an illustration, what is it? And the answer is, you go figure it out. You know? I, I, I <laughs> in the mean, meantime, I, you've, read a, you've read a commandment that never in your lifetime would you have ever read. But I, he, here's the, the, the point. The Levites mm -hmm. have no inheritance or allocation allotment, but we'll, but we'll live in cities. And you have basically somebody holding up... Or, or hanging from. Hanging from. Right. An awning of some kind, yeah. A, a concrete awning, yeah. But it's obviously a city. It's a city. It's a city. And the rest is your business. So, so how <laughs> does someone evaluate and make a determination what goes where? The, the essence of iconography is that it comes from an accumulated mythology. So when we think of St. Peter, we think of keys. Now, there's nothing in St. Peter's life that has anything to do with keys, but Jesus says to him, you have the keys to the kingdom of heaven. Said, ah, we've got a noun. So what I was looking for all through the, the, the work with B'nai Yosef up through the late 80s and early 90s was nouns. I would go through biblical scripture, through rabbinic commentary, and say, God sits in a chair, I've got a chair. Uh, after a while, I realized that the important thing was the situation, was the object. That's what held your visual interest. And whether or not it necessarily ascribed itself to being subservient to the text was less and less relevant as you study more and more iconography. So I figure at this point, I wanted to make pictures that would primarily grab your attention. Most of them, or many of them, swiped from the artists of Mad Magazine, who were the progeny of Will Eisner, uh, which is something every artist of my generation grew up with. Um, after the picture catches your attention, what happens is something that you just did. You just read a commandment that you would spend your entire life not even not knowing about, but never reading. And that's fine. So there's a kind of inept missionizing going on. At the same time, the agnostic can look at it and say, this is pure satire, and that's equally valid. So here's the question. Why did you have this put into a book when you could have had the 54 put into a book? How do you determine that you wanted to put the 613 into a book as opposed to the 54 or, or, or the rabbis or something like because that? Because this, this, this is a, ma a major statement. The, 54, the, the 613 exists as one painting. And as one painting, it has a different message than the book does. 
when you break the individual panels, the components of the 613 down, they focus on the specific commandment that engendered them. That is, when the painting is on the wall, there's no text on the wall. The painting just has the images. The text in the book is written underneath. So the book is totally different than the painting. And I thought the painting has many different lives. The painting has a purely visual experience. When I did that painting, what I thought to myself was, I'm making a painting with 613 Jewish subjects in it. But visually, I want to align it with, you know, Masaccio, with, with Giotto, with Piero. I want to align it with, uh, with the great, you know, Ajanta Caves, with the Aztec murals. I want to align it with major, major religious wall painting. Uh, that was my primary interest. When I stood back from it, after I packed it up, I realized I have another kind of document here, which I'm not giving myself credit for, and other people had to bring this to my attention, and that each of these pictures would, would relate back to the specific commandment. Now, the pictures were done partially intuitively. That is, at a certain point, you stop illustrating and you start thinking, what comes to mind when I read this? Um, when I went to see the publisher at Random House, at Blue Rider Press, I was wondering, why does this person want to print this book? I mean, I'm thrilled. And he said to me, well, the book has a vertical demographic. And I said, what's that? He said, well, there's kids, there's graphic novel people, there's comic people, there's art people, there's Jewish people, there's non-Jewish people who think of it as a biblical gift. He said, we have a, a wide range of people. Now, there's a word that I use that anybody under 50 doesn't use because you had to grow up in a community that had all Yiddish-speaking people who were, who were immigrants from, from Europe for any number of reasons. And the word, and so we picked up a lot of Yiddish in our conversation, which younger people don't have. And uh, one of the words I use all the time is chazarai, which means just a lot of junk, you know, just ephemeral stuff. And I'm sitting at the desk, and the editor says to me, well, the reason I like this book is, uh, not the editor, the publisher, says to me, the reason I like this book is it has a lot of chazarai. And I thought to myself, he gets it. You know, this is somebody who remembers what it's like to go to a delicatessen, have a corned beef sandwich, have a Dr. Brown celery. In, in the same manner, <clears throat> when... Uh... The the advertising agency created. You don't have to be Jewish to enjoy Levi's right. kosher rye, and they had a picture of an Indian right. over there. You know, it's been brought out over the years. But let, let's, as we talk about the six thirteen, we have to remember to talk about the most important parts of your family: the woman who you met when you were fourteen. Oh, my wonderful wife Maria. Yes, and your children. My children Elena and Benjamin, and, and your, my grandchildren. your daughter-in-law. My oh, my daughter-in-law Amy. Okay. Amy is the best. And Benjamin, then, Benjamin's wife, Amy, yes. And your grandchildren, their names? My daughter, Elena, has uh, Maxim, who's in college, and my granddaughter, Gabby, who's 16 and absolutely beautiful, brilliant, and athletically accomplished, and my grandson, Sam, who's Ben's son, who's a wonderful boy. So, you know, as, as they would say, the, the kid from Lafayette, yeah. you know, you've created such fantastic art, regular art and Judaic art, and you are the person responsible for Jewish art and my friend Archie Rand. Thanks again. Thank you very much, Mike. It's a pleasure. And get the book.